Welcome to the half hour to health. Red blood cells. Now this is more than a little bit important. Okay, the problem is most people don't know what, what you're talking about. Tonight you're going to learn where they're from, how they're made, and the inaccuracy of blood tests. The absolute inaccuracy of it. So it's a rough guide. Now first off, let's look at what the, what's inside of blood. There's RBCs, which is called red blood cells. There's white blood cells, which is, have a number of different parts to them. Hormones are in there. Nutrients are in there. Cholesterol's in there. Enzymes are in there. Different fats are in there. So there's a lot of constituents. Now first off, um, you got to look at there's an intelligent design in this. There really is. Now you can't say that in scientific papers. Last night I watched a movie with Ben Stein. If you want a real enlightening uh, movie to watch, it's called, um, uh, oh God, <laughs> ben, it's called Expelled, Expelled Intelligent Design by Ben Stein. Uh, and, and you've got to see it because it's really hard to, to teach inside of schools or to be accepted that there's a brilliance in this. But first off, just, just look at this. In, in men, women, they have between 6 million or 4 million red blood cells. The cells themselves are produced in the, in the long bones. Now they only last about 120 days and we're going to go through the process of how they're formed, how they're, how they're utilized, and then how they're destroyed and then even the parts of them are, are utilized. And now here, this is what a red blood cell looks like. And do you know why it has that dent inside of it? It's called a biconcave disc because it has more surface area because it's designed to carry oxygen. Now what blood does, it carries oxygen to the tissue supplies nutrients, it removes waste. Now carbon dioxide, um, it's, it's not, it, when the red blood cell um, allows the oxygen to go back into the lungs, it doesn't accept the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is actually floating freely inside of the blood itself. Uh, urea is going to be taken in there, white blood cells go through, um, coagulation. Now this is huge because have you heard of people taking anticoagulants? or aspirin because they want the blood thin. The question needs to be asked, how thin should it be? When's, thin, when's too thin? Um, they talk about blood clotting. What if you stop the clotting factor? Clotting is not only essential for life, but um, there's a thing called hemophiliacs. If they don't clot correctly, uh, death is the, the, um, the, the end result of that. And then messenger functions uh, on tissue damage. One of the most important things is each cell in the body or each organ system, they have, they're composed of certain cells. If you have damage, like let's say you've had heart injury, what happens in a heart injury is the cells that are composed of the heart, it releases enzymes in the blood. So what they'll do is if you've had chest pain, if you've had cardiac arrhythmias or something that might suspect a heart attack, they'll check the blood for heart enzymes. Let's say you've just been injured in an auto accident and they've smashed you in the right hand side. The liver's there. They might check you for liver enzymes. Myself, I was actually run over by a car and they said, hey, you bruised your heart and you damaged your liver. And I thought, cool, how did you know? They did it just by checking the blood. It's kind of interesting. It also regulates um, pH and temperature. So is having healthy blood important? Yeah, it keeps you alive. Okay, it's vital. Now. Um, look at blood, as, blood cells and plasma. Now plasma is about half of blood, but 90% of, of plasma is water. So what's the best blood thinner known to mankind? Water. Water. How many people are fully hydrated? None. I mean, very, very few. I do because my, my team yells at me all day long to drink more water. But now if, if the plasma is thicker, what do you think the heart has to do to pump this thick fluid through the system? Work, work harder. Work harder. That, okay, so now, so now dehydration, what does that cause? That's going to cause the heart to work harder, that's high blood pressure. What's the first medication they give you to lower blood pressure? Okay. Anybody know? A diuretic, exactly. Wait a second. If dehydration causes the blood to get thicker and they give you a di Can you see that that's unscientific and stupid? That's not going along with the intelligent design. Now this is huge. Another content of blood is nutrients and medications. I want to drive home how important it is to whatever you put in your mouth gets broken down and gets in the bloodstream. And we're going to see how vital that is. Now the tough part is blood tests. Um, every lab is going to have different values. 
But does and have you, have you ever seen a blood test? It has a reference range. Now these ranges are done on a hundred people without symptoms, and they're changed several times throughout the year. And the old thinking was that if you live close to the ocean, you would probably eat more fish and your diet might be a little bit higher in iodine. If you lived inland, you might be eating more meat. Of course, you know, that's, it's old school thinking because it's not true. You can get lobsters in Iowa and you can get, you know, Maine oysters in Newport Beach. You know, it's, it's, we're not limited like that anymore with our food supply. But they still do the old style where they change the lab values so a lab in Burbank is going to have different values than a lab in Newport Beach. So the reference ranges that you get for checking white blood cells or virtually any constituent inside of the blood cell is different. And so when you have a range of say 0.5 at the low end and 1.4 at the high end and you come in at 1.6 even though there's a huge difference there, they're saying, oh, it's high. Should you be worried? No, you shouldn't be worried unless you're so far out of the reference range where it's double or triple. It's a rough guide. It's only 15% of the diagnosis. Reference ranges will vary on age, sex, race, diet, prescription medications. Do they ever tell you that the, that the prescription medications will change the blood test? No, never, never, but they do. Even the instruments they use. So does this mean that different labs using different instruments will have a different reading? Yes or yes? I know, so now it gets even more complicated. And then the samples may deviate from distribution. So this means, and I'm, I'm going to show you this though, but is the blood in this arm exactly the same at the exact same moment in this arm? No. Well, don't answer yet, but you're going to see that, that, that you're answering correctly when you say no. Okay, but don't, I, it's, it's like we're building up. That's why we have this, because I want to show you how we're going to actually change the bloodstream. Um, and then this is the most frustrating part. The reference ranges, um, they're only the usual values. So they're taking 100 people without symptoms. Did I say healthy people? Yes. No, 100 people without symptoms. So a lot of times, they're not ranges for optimal health. These are just people that haven't been diagnosed with a disease yet. And since, since most people aren't really healthy today, depending on what we're eating, obviously, the optimal range for, and, and test procedures itself may be inaccurate. Now, I'm bringing up prostate-specific antigen because, for one, I'm a guy, and even, even ladies, you know, you're going you're gonna to hear about this because your man may come home and say, oh my gosh, my doctor said my PSA is high. I'm really concerned about this. It could be... Well, PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. Now, I can't, we don't have time to go through each test to test for eosinophils or neutrophils or basophils or the different triglycerides or, you know, all the different constituents of a blood test. It would take weeks. So what I decided to do is just pick one. Okay, PSA, prostate-specific antigen. Okay, prostate specific antigen. Now, not, not looking at the screen, you might think that that would be only for the prostate, right? right. Going on that second part, what's it called? Specific. Yeah. Okay, good. It's not either. Now, this was out of um, uh, the, Journal of, uh, the Journal of National Cancer Institute. PSA is not specific and has little to do with the prostate specifically. Wait a second, why is it called prostate specific antigen? Okay, that would, I have a problem with it. PSA is found in females with breast, lung, and uterine cancers. In fact, the highest levels of PSA have been found in females recovering from breast cancers. I know. I didn't know that. Isn't this interesting? Okay, and in fact, the ones with the highest PSA actually had the best recoveries. And so, so what we've got to do is understand that, that high PSA is just a temporary function of how the body's working. It doesn't mean that there's any type of cancer or abnormal finding. Now, um, this, is, this is interesting. Uh, now, this is out of the researchers of Stanford University School of Medicine in the Journal of Urology. The, ear, the PSA era is over. Now, they've been studying PSA levels for over 20 years. And what they thought of originally that it was a problem with the prostate, they are now finding out. Um